Last week we began talking about living in Babylon, how to live in a god godless culture. And to be honest, I really didn't feel like, feel very strongly that this was going to be a series uh, as we talked about it last Sunday. But as the Holy Spirit has dealt with my heart throughout the week about some things, and I've been in, in pursuit of some things, uh, I want to bring another rendering of that subject to you this, this morning, living in, living in Babylon, how to live in a godless culture, specifically looking at lessons of Daniel. Again, reading the kind of the springboard, if you will, as we look at this issue of living in Babylon, I want us to look at 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, and then verses 12 through 17 as kind of a, a foundational platform from which we'll spring from each week. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Can I just tell you, I would love to be able to stand up here and tell you how easy life is and how great everything is. But it's not that way. Now, we can be victorious in the midst of this pressure. But I'm here to tell you this, this morning, this scripture is being fulfilled in our lives. In the last days, difficult times will come. Verse 12, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, I think you can look at that, that verse two ways. I believe there's, there's evil men and, and imposters that are secular, but I believe there's also a strong case for that being the case within the church. Evil men, imposters that slip in unawares and sow damnable doctrines among the body of Christ to pull people's hearts away. But Paul says, you, however... Continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of. Regardless of what's going on around us, regardless of the pressure, regardless of how hot the battle is, regardless of how dark things become, the command for us is to continue. Keep walking. Keep walking. Don't stop. Continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. I read a little bit longer than we had on the screen there. I guess you figured that out. Now let's move on to the book of Daniel. My purpose in this is not to get into the eschatological ramifications of the book of Daniel. I ain't smart enough to do all that. But I believe there's some powerful lessons that we can draw from the book of Daniel. Amen, Brother Braswell? Beginning in chapter 2 of Daniel, verse 13, reading through verse 24. So the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill him. And Daniel replied, with the, now this, was, this is in response, let me set this up, this is in response to the king having a dream and he wanting his soothsayers to give not only the interpretation but to tell him the dream. He refused to tell the dream, the contents of the dream to anyone. And he wanted them to give the contents of the dream and then give the interpretation and none could. And because of this he was going to slay all these people. So the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill them. 
Then Daniel replied with discretion and discernment. That's something I want to get in your hearts today. He, dis- he replied with discretion and discernment to Arioch, the captain of the king's bodyguard, who had gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He said to Arioch, the king's commander, For what reason is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch informed Daniel about the matter. So Daniel went in and requested of the king that he should give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. Daniel's taking a huge step of faith here. At this point, he ain't got the slightest idea what this dream is. Nor does he have the slightest idea what the interpretation is. But he's interceding so that scores of people will not be killed. Then Daniel went to his house, verse 17, and informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, about the matter, so that they might request compassion from the God of heaven. When's the last time we prayed? God, I'm asking for compassion. So that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. So that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed and the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then in verse 19, then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel said, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever for wisdom and power belong to him. Can I tell you that one of the reasons we're devoid of revelation in this time is because men are leaning to their own intellect for wisdom and power. But when we once again acknowledge that wisdom and power comes from the Lord, I can tell you one thing, the Holy Spirit will begin to reveal things to the hearts of men. It is He who changes the times and and epochs. Listen to the words here. As he's praying, it is he, not only does he give wisdom and power, but he who, it's he who changes the times and epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness. And the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. For you have given me wisdom and power. Even now you have made known to me what is requested of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and spoke to him as follows. Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon, take me into the king's presence and I will declare the interpretation to the king. Now let's jump to another narrative, another setting in Daniel chapter 6, beginning with verse number 25. This is Darius's response to Daniel. This is Darius' response to an unwise edict that he made that could not be broken, that for a 30-day period men would not pray to anyone but the great king Darius. They would not bow to anyone but the great king Darius. And in doing so, he sealed the fate, it would seem, of Daniel. And he was cast into a den of lions. But as Daniel would go through the den of lions and come out alive, this was the testimony of Darius in Daniel chapter 6, verse 25 and 28. Then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language who were living in all the land, May your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, Men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed and his dominion will be forever. 
And he delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders. Listen now. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Father, I am leaning completely on you this morning. Lord, there is much my heart is broken about, but I am leaning on you. I need your wisdom. I need your word today. I need you to speak through me today, Father. Help me to communicate, Lord God, what you have stirred so deeply in my soul. And I'll give all the glory and all the credit to you, Father, for you are the sovereign one, and there is none like you. I pray that you would touch my frailty and my weakness and bring strength from it, Lord. And I pray that you will give me the ability, O oh God, to speak. To speak your word. That's, I, that's the cry of my soul this morning, Lord. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, I pray and believe. Amen and amen. This morning, I'm just going to be very candid with you. I don't come to you with a neatly packaged message. I don't, I don't come to you with a well-polished version of what I want to say to you today. But I'm in the pursuit of something. I'm simply in the pursuit of something. As I reflect on the current state of our nation, and maybe more specifically, I should say the current state of the American church, and I specifically say the American church because I believe that the church in the other parts of the world are not facing the, the self-harm and the self-hurt that we're bringing to ourselves here in America. And as I look at the nation, as I look at the American church, I see gr many things that give me great pause. There are a few things, however, that I'm completely convinced of. God is in control. And he has a plan. And I believe to the core of my being that as broken and as frail and as anemic and as powerless as the American church seems to be, we are still an integral part of his plan. I believe that to the core of my being. He doesn't have an alternate plan to use something other than the church. The church is his plan in this generation. And I believe to the core of my being that the harvest is still the greatest purpose of the church. The harvest. I find myself grappling with two callings. The best way I know to describe that is, is the grappling that I did prior to becoming your, your pastor. You, you've heard me share, share the story how for two or three years prior to becoming your pastor, I was grappling with two callings. I would go before the Lord and I, I, I said, God, I know without a doubt you've called me to be a pastor. And I still believe that to the core of my being today. As frail and as broken as I am, I still know that he's called me to be a pastor. But at that period of time, I was also grappling with the calling of being a son. Because I, here's the way I said it to God. God, you called me to be a pastor, but long before you called me to be a pastor, you called me to be a son. And so my plea to God was, how can I do both? How can I fulfill both callings and honor you and honor my parents? And understanding the context of that division of callings or that seemingly tension between callings, 
I find myself in somewhat of the same kind of position today. Grappling between the pressure of two callings. On the one hand, I find myself called to a harvest. On the other hand, I find myself called to speak truth to power and speak truth in this generation, to sound the alarm, to shine a spotlight on sin. And I find myself grappling with that. God, I, I believe to the core of my being you've called me to do both and I need to know how to do both. How can I do one adequately without hindering the work of the other? That's where I am. I'm just being open and transparent with you guys today. That's where I struggle. And I'm seeking the face of God about this, and it seems the Holy Spirit has been directing me to the book of Daniel to learn some lessons. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll admit to you this morning, it's entirely possible God has directed me to the book of Daniel because He wants to straighten me out. And I may be here this morning just assuming that He wants to straighten you out too. That's always the struggle with a pastor. Is God speaks something into my heart and I have to discern whether it's He's trying to do something in me or whether He's trying to do something in me so that, because He wants to do something in others as well. So good, right, you know, or indifferent. I'm operating under the assumption that I need this, but you need it as well. Today's message is going to be somewhat of an overlap with last week's message, but this morning I want to hone in a little closer on Daniel and the role he played in the godless culture of Babylon. And I want to briefly, go, briefly just look at three areas of conviction or three areas where Daniel refused to compromise his beliefs. First, I want to tell you that Daniel refused to compromise his personal convictions. He never lost sight of who he was. And he never lost sight of whose he was. Now, we need to understand something here. Do we, do we have anybody here that's 15 years old? Anybody close to 15 years old? <laughs> big, big smile. She's almost there. She's close. That's how old Daniel was when he was taken into Babylon. He was just an adolescent. But even as an adolescent, he found himself with an inner strength that allowed himself not to forget who he was, nor whose he was. He never wavered in his faith. His training given to him by his parents, the training he received as he was schooled as a youth in the laws of God, they were never lost and continually seemed to override every attempt for that culture to assimilate him. What I've just described to you is what happens in this culture today. Is there is a move to assimilate young minds. And to turn them into an image of the state or an image of secularism. We need to understand the adversity and the pressure that Daniel and his friends were under. And to understand that, we need to understand this place, Babylon. Babylon was a wonder of the ancient world. It was known for its magnificent hanging gardens. Its city lied in the, what was known as the cradle of civilization. In proximity, it was very close to where the Garden of Eden was. I don't think it's any accident that Satan would rear a city that was in close proximity that would literally be an antithesis of everything that place of paradise of God was. This place, Babylon, would be the antithesis of that. It was built around the Tower of Babel that grand effort of man to coalesce political and religious unity 
to reach the heavens and to make a name for themselves. It was a city 15 miles square, 60 miles of walls that were 30 stories tall, 80 feet thick. But Babylon was more than merely a historic earthly city. It represented a system. Satan's system on the earth. For from this system of Satan would spawn darkness. From this system would spawn the occult, witchcraft, the likes this world has never known. It would be the it would be the birthplace of humanism that would become the seeds of Marxism and socialism and communism that we grapple with today in this culture. It was billed as the way to heaven, but in reality it became the way to hell. Yet Daniel, under the pressure of this great system of darkness, was able to withstand that in the pressure, and he never lost who he was. When they attempted to change his name, he remembered that his name was Daniel. When they attempted to change his diet, he remembered the teaching of his youth. When they tried to school him in the ways of th this dark kingdom, Daniel simply stuck to his convictions and he flourished. He flourished. And it's here I find one of the most intriguing aspects think it's one of the reasons I was drawn to the book of Daniel. He was a man of unwavering devotion to God, yet he was so loyal to idolatrous kings that they trusted him with the affairs of the kingdom. Let that sink in a moment. You talk about walking a balancing act. Second, I want to illustrate to you this morning that Daniel never compromised the primacy of God in his life. And all his dealings with these idolatrous kings, he never once shied away from acknowledging that God, Jehovah, was the true and living God. Never once. Think about it. Daniel is invited to the king and he has the king's ear, and the king would, would go, come to him with riddles and great complex questions. And Daniel would give him answers that God had given him. But it, was, and it, was, it would have been so easy for Daniel to have tickled the ears of that king and told him exactly what he wanted to hear. But even at great peril, even at threat of losing his life, Daniel never wavered in his conviction of the primacy of God in his life. God placed him as a liaison of sorts. Think about this. Jesus Christ gave us the great example of being an intercessor, but God placed Daniel as the same kind of intercessor between God and man between the eternal and the carnal, the temporal, and between the holy and the profane. And beloved, can I pause here and tell you, I believe with all of my heart that God has placed the church in this generation in this tenable, delicate position of being a liaison, an intermediary, if you will, between the holy and the profane. And let me tell you, the holy is holy beyond our comprehension, but let me also tell you the profane is profane beyond even our current understanding. It was a position of delicate balance. On the one hand, he was called to speak truth to power. But, in the, but on the other hand, he must make himself needed and desirable to these ruthless kings. While making himself a thorn in the side of power, he was at the same time able to make himself so indispensable. Beloved, can I tell you, can I ask you this question rhetorically this morning? Has the church made itself indispensable in this culture? I think not. 
We're living in dark days. We're living in, in days to where not only is corruption being revealed, but the corruption is proud and loud. We're living in a day. Now, I'm not bringing politics to this pulpit. I'm bringing the Word of God to this pulpit, a, a biblical morality, a biblical truth to this pulpit. We're living in days where things are so tenable. Those days that are so uncertain. And evil has, is no longer just lurking in the crevices of darkness. Evil is coming out loud and proud. Just this week, in the halls of our Congress, a good representative from Florida stood and quoted scriptures from the Word of God as it would pertain to gender identity. He was making argument in the case, in this case that was passed through the House, this so called Equality Act. That is an action that's from the pits of hell. Make no mistake about it. If this is pushed through the Senate and it's signed by our president, it will unleash a torrent of litigious nature upon the church of Jesus Christ. But while standing in the, in the halls of the House of Representatives, reading from Scripture and saying what God had to say about the matter, congressmen were snickering in the background to the extent that one of his colleagues stood and made point of order to quiet the house so this man could speak. And he repeated the line and finished what he had to say. And following what he had to say, the Honorable Representative from New York, Jerry Nadler, stood on the floor of the House of Representatives and basically said this, the will of God as whatever faith expression you ascribe yourself to, the will of God is of no concern to this Congress. That's not a political statement. That's evil raising its head up and saying, let's just second set the record straight. This is no longer a place that where the inscription above the speaker's seat says, in God we trust. It's no longer that. The will of God is no longer of concern in th this Congress. Now, can I just pause here and tell you, let me tell you what hit me first, because I'd been studying the book of Daniel, what hit me first, immediately, when I heard him say those words, I thought to myself, this is a Belshazzar moment. This is a Belshazzar moment. You see, Belshazzar was an evil king that threw a grand party and he brought out the, the, the vessels that had been stolen from the temple and desecrated them in the midst of an orgy, in the midst of a wild, drunken, orgy party. And it was a tipping point that God says, enough is enough. And a hand appeared on the wall and wrote an inscription. And Daniel was brought in. Now this is one of those places, Brother Ray, that Daniel could have easily just said, Oh, great king, the hand was just telling how great you are. But no, at the threat of losing his life, Daniel stood before the king and says, Today you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. And your life will be taken from you. And that would mark the end of the Babylonian Empire. And the Mede and Persian Empire would assume role under the leadership of Darius. I'm here to tell you this morning, we're at a place of great darkness. We're at a place of great consternation in this world, especially in, around us. But beloved, we're yet called to be a Daniel. 
His was this delicate balancing position to speak truth to power, but to make himself needed. And there's where I'm in pursuit, Brother Ray. There's where I'm in a, in a search in my own heart. How do I as a pastor make myself indispensable in this culture? How do I lead my church to be indispensable in this culture? So that even evil rulers would desire our voice. His name was Wayne Wiles. That's not a made-up name to protect the innocent. That was his name. Wayne Wiles. We were doing a big job at Cargill in Raleigh. If you go into Raleigh, it's not anymore. I started to say you'd see them on the right, on the south side of Raleigh, but they're no more. The whole plant's been torn down. But there was these grand, big facility of grain bins, a grain facility there in South Raleigh, and that's where I'd worked much of my career as an electrical electrician and electrical engineer. And we would do a big job one summer converting the plant from very old antiquated electrical systems to new modern computer controlled electrical systems. And this job was so large, it was a shutdown so lengthy and my duties were so spread thin, I, I had to give my attention to the control and programming aspect of that job. And I did not have time to, to burden myself down with the power aspects of the job. And so the company I worked for brought in a superintendent by the name of Wayne Wiles to oversee the power part of that job. To say that we butted heads was an understatement would be an understatement. Wayne Wiles was such a cantankerous, bitter individual that he, he put a target on my head and wanted to destroy me. Even at the expense of the company's reputation and the company's ability to perform the job. And I'm just going to be honest with you. More than one time, I prayed this prayer. God, if you ain't going to change him, kill him. <laughs> kill him. I'm serious. I ain't, I ain't sugarcoating it. My wife can tell you. It was miserable. It was so bad, it got to the place that in order to get something, you, you, you see... He was going to be gone when that job was over, and I'd have to live with whatever he did on that job. And so I learned if I went to him and said, I'd like it to be done this way, he'd do it just the opposite way. So I learned that I would have to go to the men on the job, the, the foreman on the job, and I would say, listen, here's the way I'd like this to be done, and I'd tell him why. I said, but don't tell Wayne Wiles that I said it. Just don't tell him nothing. Maybe he'll let you do it if he doesn't think it came, came from me. This went on and on. This was a long, protracted job, and I was at my wit's end. Until one day, I was praying. There was a place between two grain tanks that I was known to go and find a hiding place to pray. And during... The time that Wayne Wiles was there, I found my place at that, I found myself at that place many, many times. Because it had gotten to the point to where, God, if you don't do something, I may be the one that kills him. But one of my visits between those two grain tanks in that place of private prayer where no one else was around holy conviction came over my soul. And the Holy Spirit asked me a probative question. He says, when was the last time you prayed for him? Whoa. That ain't what I wanted to hear, Brother Ray.
He said, when was the last time you prayed for him? In essence, the Holy Spirit was saying, I've heard many a prayer you prayed against him, but when was the last time you prayed for him? And I began to weep, and from that day forward, I began to pray for Wayne Wiles. We somehow managed, to make a long story short, we somehow managed to complete the job without killing one another. The job wound up being okay, and I still had my sanity. But thanks be to God, I never had to work with Wayne Wiles again. But somehow in the midst of that season where I began to pray for Wayne Wiles, the Lord changed my heart concerning Wayne Wiles, and I began to see him as a broken individual. And though I knew he didn't like me, Wayne Wiles came to respect me. And we would have company gatherings where he was a moderator of some of those company gather gatherings as one of the lead superintendents in the, in the comp comp company. And Wayne Wiles would get up and talk and before we would have a meal. And he would say, we're about to have a meal, but we're going we're gonna to do the right thing. We're going to pray before, before we eat. And he would point at me and say, Jeff Person, would you pray? That would not have come from the Wayne Wiles I knew it the first half of that job. I'm learning something from Daniel here. You see, Daniel prayed three times a day, and that's the next point. Go ahead to the next slide. Daniel prayed three times a day. He never compromised his spiritual discipline of prayer. And I guarantee you that in those prayer times, he called regularly out the names of Nebuchadnezzar, of Belshazzar, of Darius, and Cyrus. You see, at this point in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel is about 83 years old. He's lived virtually his entire life in exile and captivity under this great dark system of Babylon. But Daniel continues to pray. And I guarantee you, he called those men's names out in prayer. And in, in a foolish moment, Darius, this Medo-Persian king, Darius decided to make an edict. He was through jealousy of other... You see, at this point, Daniel had been elevated to one of three commissioners, superintendents, if you will, of the entire land. And as a matter of fact, Darius was making rumblings that he was going to elevate Daniel to the leader over all the land. Under these three leaders were 120 satraps or princes that would govern the people. That was the hierarchy, the structure of their system of government. And when these other two superintendents found out what Darius' intentions were to elevate Daniel even higher in prominence, they devised this scheme to do away with him. A scheme that they knew because they knew Daniel's convictions, they knew he would fail at. And the king would have no choice but to put him to death. Because when Darius signed his name to this edict, according to the Medo-Persian law, this was a law that could not be retracted. It could not be reversed. It was sealed. So when Daniel was found to be on the roof of his house praying three times a day during this 30-day period that men were not to pray to anyone other but Darius, he was brought before the king and Darius' heart became heavy because Darius loved Daniel. How can we get to a place where evil leaders in our culture loves the church once again? That's where I'm grappling. Daniel somehow did it. There's got to be something there that I'm seeing that I can learn from him that can teach us how to navigate these waters that we're currently in. Darius' face drew long and discouraged because he knew what he had to do. 
But he loved Daniel so much, he says, I've got to do this, Daniel, but maybe the God that you serve will deliver you from it. You see, I'm sure he probably had the historical records from those before him of the story of the other three Hebrews that came through the fire. And I'm sure he, you see, he began to lay heavier credence to Daniel's God. Maybe your God will deliver you out of this den of lions. And that was a sleepless night for Darius. The Bible says that he prayed and fasted through the night. This pagan king praying to Daniel's God for God to deliver him. The next morning, Daniel put his heart to rest. Be at rest, O king. For the angel of the Lord came in the middle of the night and shut the mouth of the lions. And I am okay. And this would become the testimony of Darius. As a result of this, I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. And his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. And his dominion will be... This is a pagan king that is rising up in the midst of a great move of God and saying, I must acknowledge the primacy of the God of Daniel. The God that he put in first place, I am now putting in first place. he would go on to testify this God of Daniel he delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and in earth do you see what I'm pursuing this morning do you see what I'm, I'm, I'm in search of Here is a man that lived almost his entire life in exile under the rule of evil kings. But look at what he was able to accomplish in the midst of the most horrible of circumstances. When the church makes itself indispensable once again. When the church makes itself indispensable in this generation. When... When the church positions itself as a place where healing takes place. So when the world needs healing, they may not understand it, but they come and find healing. When the world is bound and overcome with anxiety, and that's exactly where we are in our culture today, people are bound and overcome with anxiety. The church must set itself as a place of the purveyor of the grace of God so that anxious people run to this place. It becomes indispensable in this culture. When we become known for miracle signs and wonders, God help me here. We're known for a lot of things. But the American church is not known for miracle signs and wonders. And that may be why we're not indispensable in this culture. But when we get in our prayer closets and once again shake the horns of the altar and say, God, I will not let go of you until you touch me, until you anoint me, until you empower me for this generation. Prayer is the key. Prayer is what unlocks the door. Prayer is what turns the hearts of a nation. When we become a place known as the place where demoniacs are delivered. When we become known as the place that welcomes homosexuals so that they can be set free. When we become the place where those who are confused with who they are can come to the church and suddenly the cloud of delusion is rolled from their eyes and they see who they are in Jesus Christ. 
And we become the place where the lame get up and walk and where the deaf hear. Where the blind begin to see. Think, think, think about it. In 70 years, two of the four kings that he was under were converted. One was removed. And the last one, Cyrus, suddenly decided to finance a revival of Jerusalem. In a dark place amidst the system of Satan's city itself, one man, through his faithfulness, through learning to walk in a delicate balance between the holy and the profane, to make himself desirable and indispensable to that culture, to that generation, he changed the hearts of two kings and somehow convinced the fourth one to finance the return of a remnant to Jerusalem to rebuild it. I don't know about you, but that just blows my mind. Let me just go a step further. Not only did that Persian king finance and with his favor make it easy for that remnant to come back and rebuild the walls and ultimately the city and restore it to function, but most theologians believe it was that same Persian system, that same influence of Daniel, that hundreds and hundreds of years later would suddenly move upon Magi and they would come from the east and they would come and bow at the feet of a little babe named Jesus the Messiah and they would lay gifts at His feet and worship Him. Hundreds, the influence of Daniel hundreds of years later is still turning men's hearts to worship the Lord. There's something to this. Stand with me so I'll shut up. I ain't got it nailed down yet, but I'm, I'm hunting for it. I'm pursuing it. Daniel's teaching me something. And Daniel needs to teach all of us something. Yes. You see, when, when power is in your life, when miracle signs and wonders are evident in your life, you ain't got to be afraid to speak truth to power. But if you don't have the power of the Almighty, if you don't have the power of miracle signs and wonders working within your life, and you try to do that, culture is going to cancel you. Let me tell you what will make a church grow. Let me tell you what will make a church relevant in these times. Have a funeral. And it turns into a worship victorious service because the dead guy got up out of the casket and walked out and raised his hands with you. Yes. Business will pick up. Amen. You think I'm crazy? That's what we need to believe for. We need to believe for, my God, my God. We need to get out of our small way of thinking and believe God for great and mighty things. Because God can use this little church in this, in this community. He can use this little band of people. 
joining with other bands of people. And God can move in miraculous ways in this culture. And it won't be what the church of God has done. It won't be what man has done. It will be a decree that will go out and look what God has done. Look what God has done. I ain't got the slightest idea what we need to do now. But I somehow think prayer may be in order. Whether it's where you're at or whether it's in these altars, let me invite you to come. Find a place to pray. And let's seek the face of God today.